But my parents, I'll never forget them, grew up in Spokane. I, they came to, from the East Coast to Spokane in the 1930s. Spokane was a wonderful community to grow up in. They had a sign that said, welcome to John Bird's country when you came into Spokane. And then they had a sign saying, thank you for visiting John Bird's country when you left. So my parents, who were the president and vice president of the NAACP in consecutive years for 17 years, and the American Democratic Action Committee at the same time, found themselves like fish out of water. There were 1,000 African Americans in a city of, at that time, 160,000 people. But my father, who graduated from Lincoln University, where you went and you couldn't get into Princeton because Princeton had quotas. As my mother used to say, your father had one bad grade. He had A minus in third grade. But he was eclipsed by his sister, who said she never tainted her card with a minus in any of her A's. <laughs> my father spoke French fluently, Latin fluently, he was a master organist. He used to tease us in Latin, really annoying. <laughs> but my twin brother and I mastered Latin and would have innovative words to use at the dinner table. So he switched to French, which was absolutely obnoxious on his part. <laughs> but I remember in fifth grade, my teacher saying, go home and tell your parents to behave. So I went home and I said to my father, my teacher wants you to behave. My father said, yep, time for one more demonstration. <laughs> you see, my parents were civil rights leaders. And they had made a decision that they were going to change the social fabric of the community I grew up in. The community that did not believe in equal employment opportunity. The first time I would ever spit on my parents leading a demonstration so that the downtown stores would allow African Americans to be cashiers. Because all the downtown retailers said that white people would not take change from the hands of a black person. Cashiers. Cashiers. So I watched my parents demonstrate in a community that then passed open housing law so you could buy a home where you wanted and a community that settled its issues and allowed people an opportunity to move beyond just being a cashier. When I look at Rails to Trails, I have the same sense that people have to be focused and look at it as a movement. And in a movement, you have common goals. Not necessarily common friends, but common goals. Change is difficult. To be able to take a rail line and say that it has a value in an age of global warming is hard to explain, but it does. To look at the potential for people to bicycle and hike and connect, just connect. In the old days in my neighborhood, I used to just not like my neighbors because they would tell my mom and dad what I was doing. <laughs> you know, and I'd get home and my mother would say, you did this. I know I didn't. That was Donnie. The, uh, it, was, it was a connection that kept a neighborhood strong where the community could grow children and allow us many times to dream beyond Spokane and become greater than our hopes and our dreams. And that's what you do on trails. You don't bicycle alone. It's a social system on those bikes. I love STP. I gossiped for 300, 220 miles. Oh, I lied. Oh, yeah, you feeling good? I am feeling great. How are you feeling? My seat hurt. My legs hurt. But I was having a wonderful time. When I walk on those trails, you run into your neighbors and to your friends and people you haven't seen for a while. That's called connectivity. That's what makes communities strong. That's what creates social fabric. That's what keeps people whole and motivated. We have a country where people are divided because they have the ability to escape each other. We need places that are dense where people have to connect. My God, you have to walk next to somebody or near somebody. Maybe all of a sudden I won't fear somebody because they look like they are Muslim or Sikh or African American or Chinese or Irish or Jewish. If I have to walk near people and be around them, maybe I'll see them something different than they're, where they're you know, isolated at work. I'll break through that silo and understand what community actually means. That's the value of trail systems. And that's why they're important. 
and the next generation should live better than us. They should be able to break through these silos and these walls that we've erected in the society that allow us to talk about whether we're Republican, Democrat, with great deal of emotion and collide all the time rather than talk to each other. We need those venues that unite communities, unite, unite, unite countries. It's not just a trail. You're not just talking about trails. You're talking about the veins and arteries that allow communities to be connected. And the people on them are those things that move back and forth that provide the lifeline and the vitality for regions.